Hey guys, this is Dr. Mike Wu Ming. Welcome to another edition of Bootstrap MD, the podcast for physician and healthcare entrepreneurs. Uh, super excited about this next interview. From time to time, we love to highlight physicians who are out there in the field, making it on their own, becoming their own boss. And this is, next person is certainly a no exception. She's a board certified psychiatrist and private practice owner in Alexandria, Virginia. She completed yeah. undergrad at University of Virginia, attended medical school at Virginia College of Osteopathic Medicine in Blacksburg. She was commissioned as an army officer prior to attending medical school, and then went on to complete a residency at Walter Reed in Bethesda, Maryland, where she served as chief resident. She was then stationed at Fort Stewart Hunter Army Airfield near Savannah, Georgia, where she worked in multiple embedded behavioral health clinics, inpatient settings, and a behavioral health consultant to Army leadership. After leading, leaving the Army, she returned back to Virginia and opened up her own concierge psychiatry and wellness practice. She now has a team of four other providers, a psychiatric PA, two therapists, and an acupuncturist, where they all collaborate to provide premier level care to their patient base. She also operates in the capacity of a medical director and also leverages her knowledge of nutrition and integrative medicine to teach her staff and deliver optimal patient care. I know we're going to learn a lot from her today. I'd like to introduce Dr. Erica Kappes. Dr. Thank Kappes. you so much for having me. Wonderful. Well, you know, this interview has, has taken so many twists and turns. <laughs> and, uh, I canceled on you. Uh, you've canceled on then me. <laughs> didn't get a recording on it. And just so many different <laughs> things. And I, I know that the universe, there's a reason for all of this. So uh, yeah, so I know this is gonna be a, a great uh, interview and, and love to share uh, nuggets of information to our audience. So uh, let, uh, without further ado, let's talk about this because you know, unfortunately these days, less and less physicians are wanting to strike out on their own, start up their own practice. Maybe you can talk about your beginnings of, of how you were able to do just that. Yeah. So um, thank you so much again for having me. This is great. Um, but I, you know, coming out of the army, I would say I was sort of in, in this institutional mindset of having to, you know, work in another big company where I get my paycheck every two weeks and get told what to do and have very limited flexibility. Um, so I did do that for a little bit outside of the army um, for a couple months. And I knew right away that it was not gonna be a good fit for me long-term. I even considered leaving medicine altogether or going back to residency in a different field as if that would solve the problem. Um, and then I decided, no, I actually wanna stay in my own field and create something um, that I have been thinking of for a while. So, which is a boutique, you know, mental health practice, a beautiful space where people come and have a, an amazing experience um, and a really flexibility to do what I want to do with it. And so I reached out to people who were, had similar practices that I were very, I was inspired by one of them, you know, Dr. Brooke Chalet, who I, I know you've had on your podcast and she helped mentor me um, as well as some other physicians as well um, who were doing similar things, mentored me how to get started. A lot of it's just getting that first step going. Cause I, I they think I really didn't know even how to start that first step. Um, so one day I opened my doors in one room and um, two years later, I'm in a bigger office suite with five offices, newly renovated with a team of uh, four other providers and myself and, and doing very well. And I love my work. So it's been a really cool experience. And I, I'm curious, did was there any uh, like entrepreneurs in your family that maybe not necessarily in, in medicine or perhaps in your upbringing did you do any type of entrepreneurial activities as as a teenager or a college student, anything like that? The answer is no. <laughs> and I think, you know, I, I love my parents. They're fantastic and brilliant people, but they, I think, struggled at times with understanding even what I was doing. Um, you know, like, why don't you just get a nine to five or, or join a different practice or things like that? Um, and so I think for a lot of people who are used to maybe more government jobs or the standard nine to five, or it's possibly a generational thing as well. It's hard to wrap your mind around starting something from nothing, essentially, and, and, and knowing that it's going to take off, but being patient to let it take off. And, and that's, a, you know, that's tough for a lot of people that have patience. But no, I didn't come from any kind of background like that. I think, to be honest with you, I think my family was pretty shocked. Um, and I really 
didn't think I, you know, I thought I had to wait for the perfect time. And as we've talked about before, have more practice in business. And I, I realized it's really not the case. You just got to get started. Um, surround yourself with people who also are doing similar things. Um, that that That's what helped me and reaching out to people who, you know, have sort of like blazed that trail already. Um, but once I got into it, I was like, oh my gosh, this is so much fun. It's such a creative process. Um, I, I, I mean, I've had a blast um, sort of forming this practice, creating it, adding to it, changing things. Um, for me, that's really exciting. I mean, not everyone feels that way, but for me, that's been a really cool experience. In what way did the military perhaps uh, shape you in the direction that you're going? And 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 I'm thinking both positively and, and perhaps even negatively. And the reason yeah. why I say this is uh, my father-in-law is a, a Navy man, been in there 30, 40 years. Uh, and actually, when he retired, it actually had you know difficulty kind of making that transition to mm -hmm. a civilian work. Anything mm -hmm. like that? Uh, you know, kind of, uh, you know, alter your, your thinking or perhaps shape you in the direction that that you led you to to start up your own practice? Yeah. So I, I, also, I also struggled with coming out of the military and I wasn't in there for a career. I did, I, I, you know, the HPSP scholarship, which for med students, it's the, you know, the military pays for you to go to medical school and then you do residency typically with the military. So I did mine at Walter Reed and then I, you, you get four years active duty back based on what you trained in. So I did psychiatry, which is a four-year residency. You get four years back active duty. If you were like a five-year surgery residency, you would do five years and that kind of thing. Um, but um, I came out of it feeling very untethered, even though the military was not something long-term for me, as in it didn't, I wasn't able to nourish more creative outlets. I am a very creative person. I think I was like an art curator in a different life maybe. Um, but I didn't wasn't able to like let explore that as much in the military. So I was eager to get out. But once I got out, it's kind of like, oh boy, what do I do now? I'm I'm in this huge sea and I have no idea how to navigate myself. Um, I also was I always felt like I was on the precipice of what I wanted to do as an open something, do my own thing, but I didn't know how to do that. And we definitely didn't learn that in residency, medical school, or the military. Um, the military is set up to maybe like keep you doing something similar to the military. Um, so a lot of people go work for the VA and there's nothing wrong with that, but that is just not for me. Um, and so I think I came out of the military feeling a little bit lost and untethered the, on the positive side. I, I did, you know, you build up some resilience being in the army um, in my case, because you don't have a lot of control over your life or your day to day. So I think maybe that resilience was helpful during this time of the transition, but it was a tough transition for me. So I think for anyone coming out of a career in the army, it's probably, or the military, it's probably an even harder transition. Um, I was able to tether myself finally, once I sat down and made a plan of where, where I wanna see myself in a couple of years, but that took a little bit of time to even get to that point as well. When so. you decided, yeah, this is that's that's great to to you know to understand the you know the the kind of conflict that that you had for for some time and finally finding something that you could really, you know, uh, stabilize you in the direction yeah. you wanted to go. So let's talk about those early early years or early times when you you know you you had the decision you 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 had a, a practice. Was it uh, you know in your head that you this is what you envisioned, or you know were there people out there, you know, we, we mentioned Brooke uh, Chalet out there that you kind of modeled after, or did you, you know, think of this, I know what I wanted to do, and now I want to seek out mentors or experts who've already kind of blazed that trail. Yeah, so I think I had an idea, I remember having an idea of what I wanted to do, and then I found uh, Brooke Chalet, we become, um, she she was my uh, sort of a consult business consultant, I would say, on some level, coached for me for a little bit, and now we've become friends. Uh, you know, I consider her a friend of mine and we support each other from different coasts. Um, but anyways, um, she, you know, I, I saw what she was doing. I knew that that was something I sort of wanted to do. So I really researched all the practices in, in I would say the country that were doing similar things that I wanted to do. And then I just cold called people. I mean, I, I called a practice in New York city with a woman who, um, 
Dr. Namavar, who was doing some interesting things up there. And I just reached out to her coldly and she was lovely. I mean, she said like, let's get together on Zoom, let's talk. So people will respond if you ask for help um, or, or even inquire about what they're doing. Um, so I, I found some really interesting people. And then I started crystallizing what I saw for myself and doing one little step at a time. And as I gained more confidence in what I was doing and honestly getting more business, I then was like, oh, this is actually where I see myself. You just keep like changing course. Um, I see the space being like this. I see the experience being like this. I want to add more services, acupuncture. I want to bring a PA on um, who helps um, seeing patients and, and sees them at a different rate as I do. So just sort of like making different business decisions. Um, and, and I've thoroughly enjoyed that um, piece, just sort of like every time there's you get new information, you pivot and do something different. So I think it's been pretty fun. Yeah, you highlighted one of my favorite words as an entrepreneurship and really a skill that you need to learn, and that is pivot. Yes. <laughs> and, and to be able to be flexible to not and not to be tied down with with perhaps, you know, old school thinking or the way yeah. that you think it is. And, and oftentimes, you know, I learn not just from mentors, but even from my own clients and patients who like, you know, we launch a particular treatment and, you know, nothing really happens. And then, you know, we pivot to, to mm -hmm. something that seems yep. to be more palatable to, to, to the audience. And, so and I think like, even like the people who work for me, I mean, if you ask them, I mean, I hope to God they'd say they love working here. It's, I mean, it's, it's a, I, I find it a great place to work. I've made the experience really enjoyable, but they, you know, they have ideas too that sometimes I haven't thought up of. And, you know, my mind is full of all kinds of different things. But for example, the, the PA Lauren who works um, with me, who is just like amazing, um, she'll come to me with marketing ideas and she has different marketing ideas than I have. And I'm like, yeah, I never thought of that. Let's try that. Um, let's reach out to this group. Let's, you know, so she's really helped market our business in a way that I hadn't even thought of in a, in a, a prior. And so it's been great to get other points of view. And I'm always open to that, which is one thing I love about business. Like you can kind of do all, all kinds of things. Um, you, you have a lot of freedom to, to practice and, and design things the way you want to. And I'll yeah. be honest with you, even getting to that mindset was like hard coming out of the army. Cause I was like, oh wait, I am my own boss. You have to keep reminding yourself of that. <laughs> Want to stay up to date with physician experts and entrepreneurs? Join the lounge to stay informed with physician insights and stories. The latest physician, investor, and entrepreneur info emailed directly to you. Join the lounge at bootstrapmd.com slash the lounge. I'm sure the general isn't asking the private for, you know, uh, uh, military, uh, no. you know, no, 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 no. Nice. Um, but, but, but it is, it is important that we have a, you know, we have our monthly staff meetings and mm -hmm. every so often, you know, we'll, we'll ask, you know, each one, they may not say it individually. They might email it to me or talk to me privately. And, mm -hmm. and basically the question is, is, you know, um, I want you to name, is there something that you're currently doing or is, is there, do you feel that there's a different method where it, it could help your job better? You know, whether right. it be, become more efficient, you know, the way that we room patients, the way that we answer phones, the way we deliver information, mm -hmm. because you're not in that, you know, yeah, I mean, and so I ask everybody, I mean, you know, from the medical assistant on, on, on up, yeah. doesn't really matter, it, it's all of their information is valuable, yep. and, uh, you know, they want to work, they want to, to have a long, hopefully they want to have a long uh, working relationship with you as well, and, you know, oftentimes those questions, you know, those, those concerns don't get answered by, you know, higher ups uh, right. it's unfortunate but it is right. very important as an employer to yeah. be able to, to be given that uh opportunity yeah no exactly and I, and i think you know people want to feel like they're part of something interesting and, and part of a creative process as well so um i take everyone's you know recommendations you know very seriously and consider implementing them if, if i feel like they're they're in line with the practice yeah, so let's talk about that because one of the things that we we, we had mentioned uh, previously is is your your ability to assemble a team and, and mm -hmm. some things along the way that could be useful to our audience. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. So actually, another thing coming out of the army, 
um, you don't get to choose your team in the army. So you look around, that's who you're with, regardless of what you want. So that, that was, you know, that's what I was used to. So when I opened the practice, it was just me in one room. And I pretty, you know, pretty quickly realized I had to bring on extra people. So when I started doing that, um, it was a challenge for me because I had to really instill this level of trust in them. Like I will, this will turn into this, by the way, I'm sitting here, I'm pregnant. So obviously at the time, so obviously like the writing is the wall that I'm going to go out for a little bit. And there was no lease sign for a new space yet. And, you know, there was a lot of things still sort of like hanging in the balance. So I had to say like, please trust me. I, this is what this will look like eventually. And this will all be, you know, this is what my vision is. And I need you to have that shared vision. And it can be tough for people to really trust like that because, you know, I I think I said it the last time, one of the most addictive things in, I guess, the world in America is a paycheck every two weeks. So like the same paycheck every two weeks. Um, So when you, so when you are, um, coming away from that, it can be very scary. And I totally acknowledge that because that was my experience as well. So, and I, I had to say like, you know, I, I know that this is how this is going to look, but please trust me. So I had to, I had to really find people who had a shared vision and that is, um, that took some time and that, you know, really like sifting through who could stick with me, even if there were times that weren't as busy as others. Uh, and so I found that team. They're wonderful. Every, all of my people who work with me are just amazing people. So, um, it's been a great experience, but it did take a little bit of, uh, it was like a trial and error at first. So can we make me talk about, did you have any hiring tips or hacks that uh, you felt uh, led to you to that that perfect, uh, you know, team that you've assigned? Yeah. Um, I mean, honestly, go with your gut. <laughs> I think sometimes like we ignore our gut when it comes to like personality difficulties. Um, and you have to like really listen to that intuition and sometimes, you know, myself and my business partner would, would interview and he is extremely logical and a numbers guy and he's amazing. Um, but we may have had different like intuitions, maybe like I'm, you know, and so you really have to like be on the same page. Um, and if you have, if you notice red flags in your gut, you have to go with it. Um, in my opinion, like if you sort of notice things that like aren't you aren't sure that's going to work out, um, the the relationship of you know contractors or people employed is a very like can be a difficult relationship, and it's you know you want it if, if there is any friction there. So um, it, it just I, I guess my recommendation is go with your gut if you feel like something is off. Yeah, well, and one thing too that I, I, I probably shared last time with you is you know, when you're building up your team, don't just rely on yourself to do the interview. Absolutely. Um, I've had it where we were inter- we were interviewing a, a PA and um, I quickly, I thought the interview went really well. Um, she said everything I wanted to hear. And then we did a quick kind of tour around, you know, you know the office and, and meeting some of the staff. And, uh, you know, I went, when the the applicant left. I talked to Bree, my my uh, mm-hmm. PA, other PA at the time. And he says, "What did you think about her?" And she says, "I did not like her at all." And he goes, "What right. do you mean by that?" He says, "Look how she treated Jeanette. Jeanette's our our medical assistant. She babe, she did not even acknowledge that person in the room. Mm-hmm. Only wanted to converse with her and myself. Mm-hmm. And uh, you know, the, and so there obviously there she probably had some status." Yeah. you know, um, ideas of who, who to talk to and perhaps the quote underlings aren't the worthy yeah. of talking to. I said, yo, I did not notice that. Yeah. You picked up on it right away. Um, and so having other people getting different perspectives, sometimes they know, you know, on an interview, they know most people know how to interview and they know what, what to say, mm-hmm. but the, you know, what they're saying behind the scenes is maybe a different story. Absolutely. And so I actually learned that, uh, that exact thing after a couple, you know, months after I started interviewing is like have multiple people interview. Um, so now I do that. Like I have different, you know, if I, if we were going to bring on someone else, I'd have the PA interview, one of the therapists, but I definitely don't just rely on myself or even, um, my business partner, Cody, even though I trust his judgment, it's just that like, sometimes we're so deep in the weeds with things. So it's good to have that outsider. Yeah. So let's talk about, to, let's talk for the explorer. You, you got the team, you you got the Avengers assembled. You, and so how <laughs> do you work in a cohesive unit? 
What are some yeah. of the strengths you use? Yeah. So, um, like I said, you know, I think, you know, just really, you know, taking everyone's viewpoint seriously. I mean, I think, I hope that they would say they love working with me. I, I give a lot of flexibility with scheduling when people see patients, when people don't see patients, um, as long as they're meeting the standard that I see for this practice, um, which they know, because that was like, like outlined to them when they came on board. And that's one of the reasons they like the practice. Um, as long as that's going on, like I don't micromanage. I try not to micromanage. I, I do check on the clinical work at times and I'm always around for, um, especially with the physician's assistant with any clinical questions. And I'm always available for anything, whether it's, you know, concerns, um, things that need to be adjusted, clinical questions. Um, so I think that's a huge thing as well, being available to people like quickly and not just like, oh, I'll call you back tomorrow. Like I'm, I'm always available for people, whether they just want to talk or whether they want to talk about business related matters or, or patient related matters. Um, so I think that's been really helpful. And I, and I think that if you would ask any of uh, my staff, they would say that, you know, I'm always around for, for anything that they need. Um, yeah. but they also they also have an expectation of a standard and like I don't even have to voice that like they know because I model that standard myself. That's great. I mean, you know, they, they need somebody to, to model after. Yeah. And, you know, I've had, had situations where I, I, I deal with clients, uh, you know, business clients. And, you know, I, I there's one doctor say, you know what, they, they're not making PAs like they used to, uh, you know, in terms of work ethic and everything like that. But then I know there's a pattern. He went through a PA like almost every month. And then if, you're, if it's, if it's not, it's not the PA, it's you. And yeah, you're, like, you're it's probably of, you. Yeah, it's the king of micromanaging. Um, to some extent, obviously, you know, well, I like to start when I'm hiring, I usually have them on a trial basis, you sure. know, for three months or, or something like that, whether you like us and we like you. Mm -hmm. uh, and then once you're able to do it, it, it really is important. You know, at the end of the day, when it comes down to it, it ultimately, it falls on you. It's not necessarily yep. the employee. It's, you know, was it the way that I gave, or was it not clear? Or did I yeah. not give directions? And, and oftentimes, you know, not to say everything is, is but a lot of it, it, it falls on the employer or the boss. Um, you know, at the end, you you want them to be proactive. You know, yeah. you got to get away. There's no way you can run a, a practice where you're micromanaging everything. No. Go so insane. I don't have enough time in the day to do that. Yeah. And you have to give them, and you have to give them responsibility. And and sure, there'll be times where you you want to check up, you know, at, at there and, and, and make sure that, everything is is there but we have it so each person is accountable you know accountable yep. on a regular basis and they have to report yeah. you know what what was done at the end of the week or end of the quarter what what have we done to to get exactly. to accomplished yeah yeah exactly and you know for the pa obviously you know i you know from the clinical side of the house i'm you know i'm i supervise her and so um you know i i really was watching, you know, to make sure her clinical acumen was, you know, up to snuff. Obviously, like personality is great, but you also want someone to be technically very good at their craft. Um, so that was a, and she's, you know, she she's amazing. But um, that, you know, I obviously you have to check on that when you first hire someone because that does fall under your license. So, one hundred percent, one hundred percent for sure. So let's talk about, uh, again, I, I like talking about those early days. Sometimes they can be pretty painful, but I think a lot of lessons can be learned uh, from those. Uh, you know, we have a number of people listening. They're looking to start up their clinics. You know, um, let's just talk about kind of the things that we often have to talk about, like uh, expenses and, and money. Um, I think last time you did, you told me you weren't uh, inherited some big fortune to start up your own. No, I wish. Uh, what are, what, what, what were some ways that perhaps, you know, did you, did you bootstrap your way? Did you yeah. take some loans? Um, yeah. what are some things and what should we be spending money on? Yeah. You know, when we're, yeah. Yeah. So I, um, did not, yeah, I didn't come from wealth or anything like that, but, um, I also did not take any loans out. I, um, started small and didn't spend a lot of money on overhead at the beginning. Um, so I live in the DC area. Rent is extremely expensive around here. Um, you know, so it was a little intimidating, but I started out small, one very cool room essentially, um, that I decorated in a really funky way. So people were like, oh, this is kind of neat. They, they thought it was very intentional, even though I'm like, this is all I could get right now. <laughs> um, but, uh, that was okay. And then I just, because I was paying so little on rent, 
to start out with, I was able to save a lot of money. And then um, once I, we were ready to move into a bigger space, we were able to afford that as well as completely furnish the space, which obviously was a massive expense. But I had saved, I, I didn't let my like um, lifestyle flex based on the money I was making. I think a lot of people do that. They start making more money. Suddenly they're, you know, driving a hundred thousand dollar car and buying Chanel shoes. Like I wasn't doing all that. I, I was, I recognized that there was something I was, you know, you know, banking for, for the future happened. Cody, my business partner is like a money is a numbers guy. So he also would keep me in check with that. Um, because he runs, he also, he, you know, was tracking the books and everything. Um, but I think, you know, you want to like, make sure you know what your long-term vision is because we all are have a tendency to want to flex our lifestyle based on making more money. Um, and it's really, that's where you get in trouble. You can't save like that. I did not take any loans. I think that, you know, some of my uh, friends did, and I think that's reasonable, but just for me, I didn't need it because I wasn't bringing in any huge machines at the time. Um, I think for some places like aesthetic practices, you do have to have bring in lasers and, and all that kind of stuff, which is, you know, great but you do probably need loans for these types of things um but for me i was you know psychiatry practice the way i started i didn't need all that yeah and, and i tell them you know because as you know i run med spas i didn't get my first laser until eight years in practice right yeah Didn't necessarily have to be the first thing that that you want to do so exactly. you, you spent money not too much on the furniture and the decorations um no, what, I did, but this was after I had money. <laughs> well, now you can get the balloon, right? So um, what was your first, besides your business partner, what, what was your first hire? Or which so my you... first hire was Dr. Farrell. She's a um, she's a therapist and um, a, a couples therapist and a you know an individual therapist. So I so she would take all my therapy patients and we started marketing couples therapy. Um, because insurance isn't covered couples therapy anyway, so it actually fell perfectly in line with the practice. Um and then we brought on an acupuncturist, which I actually did have to invest some into like the very nice bed that we got and all of the acupuncture supplies. Um, but that was just, a, you know, that that was, you know, quite a bit of, I would say, expense. But it, it was, you know, because I had saved money, it was it ended up being totally fine. And then when I knew I was going out on maternity leave, I knew I needed to bring another uh, medical provider in. So I brought in the PA and then another therapist as well. Uh, what about ancillary stuff, your front desk or any any of those? Yeah, or... so I actually didn't spend a lot of money on that. I did um, most of that. Cody and I would basically run the calls ourselves. Oh, wow. Um, so I, at the beginning, we didn't spend a lot of I mean, the startup costs for me, like Brooke, you know, Dr. Chalet was, her advice was like, just get going with it. You know, obviously do the basics and just get going with it. And I think that if I had waited around to have everything perfect, I never would have gotten going, you know, gotten, gotten off the ground. Um, it would have been like, wait for the perfect, you know, time to do this or the perfect website. If you wait around for that, it just, time goes by so fast. You never get to it. Yeah. Yeah. There, there's never a perfect time. No. Oh, but if I make X amount, you know, now I can for this and sometimes you just need to do it no you, you just know? need to do it and you know eventually you know like, like i told you like next week our new version of our website's coming out it's going to be beautiful but obviously like that took me some time to get the bandwidth to you know redo that once i had the new space set up so it's not as important initially i mean yes you want it for marketing you want it in sort of nice for marketing but if you really want to refine it you have time to do that once right. you sort of are in the business so what started bringing in the patients for you? Did you do your own yeah. ground, uh, you know, game marketing? Uh, yeah, I, uh, we, hustled, we, hustled, we hustled, we hustled. I was, I was getting coffee and lunch with every therapist, other physicians in the area every single week, about twice a week, I was meeting face to face with internal medicine doctors, um, family practice doctors, concierge physicians in the area, therapists, like women's health specialists, um, Cody was bringing donuts to like concierge OBGYN practices just so we got our name out there. We also um, sent out a bunch of postcards with our name on it saying we were open, we were taking new patients. So I did, you know, we did invest some money into marketing. Um, we started running some Google ads, not, not a ton, but just enough so you could find us in the area. And basically it was word of mouth. It was my foot game. I was in, I was in all of these events. I mean, it was exhausting. And what, uh, 
what compelled uh, them to, to sit down with you? Was it the donuts? Was it your sparkling? I person? think they were actually surprised. They were like, wow, we don't usually have doctors reaching out. To People said that so many times. We don't usually have doctors like reaching out to us like this. Um, and I was like, oh, OK. Um, and so they were like happily like, wow. And then they'd start referring patients to me because we'd already had this conversation and they felt like, you know, we could collaborate on patients. I also, um, you know, became acquaintances with a concierge internal medicine um, guy in, in Old Town Alexandria. He and I sat for coffee. We, you know, kind of talked about our the way we do business, and he started sending me over patients and vice versa. So I wanted to connect with like-minded people. And of all of those different things that you did, what you think had the most impact in terms of marketing or bringing in? Honestly, sitting down with people. I mean, for me in this area, it's a, it's a, this area is a lot of like getting your name out and reputation. This is the DC area. Um, and so um, I think it helped a lot because I'd, I'd suddenly get referrals like, oh, my therapist knew this other doctor who mentioned your name and they, you know, sent us over here. So it, it was a lot of work at the beginning. I did enjoy it because it was something different than just my old nine to five job of seeing patients all day. So I was like getting dressed up, going out for coffee. I mean, you know, it was kind of fun. And you know, you were doing it for like your, essentially your your child, your business that you were forming. So you, I felt really like excited about it. Um, and so, you know, that was, that, that went a long way. I went to practices to visit. I gave a couple talks at a couple local practices. Yeah, I love it. I love it. And, uh, you know, it, it's funny in, in this era of internet and, and and social media, and you know, I have docs saying, do I need a dance on TikTok? You know, at the end of the day, no. what I always felt it has the biggest impact is what my partner calls, you know, you have to have a great ground, ground game. You have yeah. to have. And uh, like you said, you know, you're not too big to actually sit down and, ha and have, you know, coffee with your providers and, and yeah. it. And, you know, if you have that mindset, I you, I think you're really kind of missing the boat, as you said, yeah. it was kind of a, a breath of fresh air for them sitting down and getting to really know them. And, yeah, and they were like, like literally the amount of times I heard, we literally never had a doctor reach out to us like this. Yeah. Um, and I was like, oh yeah. And I'd, I'd have like, at the time, you know, some people were still wanting to do Zoom. It was 2022. So, yeah. or I think the early 2022. So I I'd do Zoom kind of coffee with other providers. Uh, a couple of practices wanted to do like Zoom calls with me with all the members of their practice, just so they kind of knew um, I was out there. And I became friends with some of the um, other providers. I mean, I got to know people in the area myself. Um, and uh, yeah, it's funny. I don't even have, I, I keep saying I need to get an Instagram page for the practice because I know people do. I don't have any social media for this practice. And Somehow I feel like it makes it a little more mysterious and cool, but I also know that like social media is a thing now that I may have to get on board with, but I, um, I've done all of this with no social media. Yeah, it, it's one thing, but you know, I tell them, and, and I come from an online background, marketing background, mm -hmm. you shouldn't be spending all that money on, on Google and, and no. face if you haven't done the ground game. Yeah. It's so essential. Yeah, it's it's and honestly, I got that idea from Dr. Shule. I mean, she um, she's done an amazing job of connecting herself to therapists and physicians in her area, and she's you know well known in that area, and that's how she did it. And so I was like, oh, that's interesting. Um, and I modeled. I kind of knew that that was what I figured. This is a similar area, urban area. People know each other here, and that worked for me. So I, I very much value that piece of advice she gave me. Well, we're coming to the, the end of the interview. This has been amazing. Lots of great uh, information and nuggets for someone either considering opening up their own practice or perhaps they're out of practice right now and, and maybe it's a little bit stagnant. Uh, get some great ideas to to kind of accelerate the process. Yeah. So any yeah, yeah any uh, last minute thoughts or advice you, you, you'd you give to that those uh, perhaps uh, early practice uh, owners out there? Yeah, I mean, just keep at it and let it grow organically and, and sort of, you know, don't rush things, be patient. Um, organic growth was really big for me rather than cancerous growth. Also for people who are stuck in jobs, I don't like, and they want to open a business, just do it. It's the best thing ever. I love my job. I literally love what I do. Sometimes I'm like, is this seriously my job? Like, it's so awesome. Um, and not, like I said, last time, not many doctors will say that about what they're doing. <laughs> 
So I, I feel lucky. I, I, I just am having a really good time. If somebody wanted to to reach out to you and perhaps uh, pick your brain as as someone else did for you, uh, oh you have to go. Oh uh, my gosh, I'd love it. Where would be the best place for them to, to reach yeah, out? Yeah, email me, um, Dr. Kappa said district wellness dot com. But um, and it's uh, I would I would love to share any pieces of knowledge or help people out. So feel free to reach out. All right. Well, wonderful, Dr. Kappas. Again, her uh, practice is called District Psychiatry and Wellness. You can go out, check out her website. We'll leave that in the show notes. Thank you for your time today. It's been illuminating. <laughs> it's good. It's good to talk to you again. It was even better the second time around. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you again. And thank you for listening. As always, you're going to have ups and downs in your business. It's always a important to seek out mentors, find out people who may be doing what you want to be doing, seek them out, uh, get their advice and keep moving forward.